Should the government set the definition of marriage? Is what we're talking about. Now we've we've hit this verse almost every week since we've been doing this study. You know, for it, the government is God's servant to you for what is good. And I know this is kind of a, a you know, boom, here's this statement, and you can apply it in a lot of different things, but it really does highlight the fact that the government's role is to make sure that it's for the good of the people, right? The good of the of the people that it oversees, the nation that it it is in charge of. And so is God's definition of marriage something to promote or something to discourage for the good of a nation? We kind of ended here last week. You know, some people say, well, don't, don't do anything with it. Don't discourage, don't promote, don't do anything. And, you know, but Romans says that the government's there for the not neutral. <laughs> it does say it's there for the good. And it actually goes on to say that, you know, part of the government's job is having the sword, which is to punish evil and reward good. And, you know, that opens that can of worms we probably opened almost every week. How do you define these bold terms? How do you define good? You know, is my definition of good different than someone else's? And when there's a dispute, whose definition wins the day? And that's why we have to say there has to be an authority ultimately on good. And so when we're asking the question of marriage, is God's definition of marriage something to promote or something to discourage for the good of a nation? So the question is, is God's definition of marriage actually benefit the country? Yes. Yes. Does it promote good things coming to the country? Right? I mean, that's really the question. And so how would we know if it was good? Well, you could say, yeah, you could say, well, the Bible says it's good. Or you can look at the country and say, how are they doing right are they dying off are we losing you know we're going the wrong way when it comes to population you know what's the quality of the citizenry how are the people acting you know um it's it would you agree that it has changed with the younger generation now becoming parents they don't parent the same way my grandparents parented i can tell you that <laughs> and to some degree you, you you think about that and you go is that a did my parents do, a, or my grandparents and my parents do a better job than the generation that's kind of the young parents today? The, time, the times are different. They are different, you know, that's for sure. So here's some things on why the government should define marriage. Okay, I know this might be a topic of, hey, stay out of it, don't define it, but here's just a few things. So the pro promotion of marriage as defined by God leads to, and here's a few things it leads to, children. Okay, that's a good thing. You know, the Bible says that children are a blessing, that they're a good thing. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them, right? And, but why does this matter to the government? I mean, why is it a good thing to have children in the nation? Why does the government care? Why would they care? Do we want to die off or do we want to keep going? And when we have children enter the, the scene in the nation, the question is, what do we want them to know? What do we want them to believe? What do we want them to think? What do we want them to do? Is that not kind of a debate and a battle that's going on today? You know, what are they being taught? What are they supposed to be taught? What are the foundational pieces? You know, I think they used to do, you go to school and they would do, the, I remember doing the Pledge of Allegiance every day. Do they still do that? No. Some of them do. Some do. High school does. I mean, maybe there's some schools that don't, but I did that. Did they, did they open the, the uh, school with a prayer anymore? No. They used to do that. You know, they used to start the day and they would have, have a prayer. And, and so, you know, things have changed a little bit because the question is, what are we getting the kids to believe? You know, remember the battles over the Ten Commandments? You know, should we put the Ten Commandments up in schools? And there's been all these legal fights over whether they should be displayed in public and those types of things. But there was a time when it wasn't just we want you to have kids, but we want the kids to understand these fundamental pieces of right, wrong, how to behave, you know, how to act, and so on. And so it kind of has a twofold piece. Should the government be concerned about the population growth and making sure that we have another generation? I think that's a good thing to promote is people having children, right? It's also a good thing to promote how to raise children, how to teach children good things, you know, how to properly behave and 
how to work hard, and you know, there's some elements there to promote these things. And so children being produced or the future is an important piece because that c it should come from marriage. What happens when you have a negative birth rate? It's kind of an obvious question. Yeah. In fact, I think, you know, um, that's a discussion that goes on in our country is, you know, the birth rate's not what it should be. And we're, I think, comparatively to other countries, we're way behind. So you can almost exterminate yourself if the government did not promote, if they discouraged people from having kids, you could almost kill yourself off, you know, if you think about it. So the promotion of marriage is defined by God leads to children being raised and taught properly. It's kind of like what we just talked about. It's not just having kids, but having them be contributing quality citizens. They're not out there causing trouble and, you know, going, you know, end up in jail. What are these different things, you know, that can happen, but, but trying to teach them what's acceptable in society, you know. And I think that in the past, we, the society probably did a better job of this. Would you agree with that? That there was definitely these kind of cultural taboos, like if you did this behavior, everybody kind of, you were kind of shunned by society. You know, we kind of like, well, that was terrible. But to some degree, it was to keep people from doing that behavior, right? It kept women from being exploited in a lot of ways because, you know, when you have marriage, a husband and a wife, you didn't have what happens a lot of times, which is single moms. You know, they're trying to raise a child. At the same time, they're trying to provide for that child. And so that creates, could create burden on the system to some degree if they need assistance, right? And so is the government interested in that? Yeah, because that's, I mean, that's our resources. I mean, that's resources that they're responsible for taking care of. So what's the best way to have this work? A husband and a wife, and they're together working together one maybe even stays home or they're both working and then they have children and their children now are taken care of and guess what the government doesn't necessarily have to be involved in that they can just foster that encourage that environment but when you break marriage up as god's defined it you have all these other things that enter the system now you have single moms you have husbands and or, or men who go out and they might have 10 children with different women and do they pay for that well they might end up in court trying to but they can't but the idea here is you have children being raised and taught properly through a male and female example not just one or the other you know and we recognize those things do happen the accidents happen tragic events happen things take place but again we're talking about what ought to be and what the government ought to encourage right which is a man and a woman getting married and having children in that union and then being dedicated not only to each other but to their children and taking care of that. And that is the best way a society flourishes. It takes the biggest burden off the system and contributes the most to the nation. The upholding of the marriage union by government limits the number of single moms if they said we want to promote this and then we take away some degree the things that would encourage single parenthood what would happen it would limit marriage more to well i got to get married and the union is is promoted the government promotes that and so that keeps it solid the way it should be right mm -hmm. flourishing economy if you think about this when you have husband wife you know i'm thinking back 50s you know there was kind of a little different dynamic then but you had the husband and the wife they got married they might have a farm but usually the husband would go off to work and then the wife would take care of the home, right? Mm -hmm. And raise, you know, take care of the kids while you know, the husband was gone. And that's how they did things. And then we kind of, as we went on in society, now you have husbands and wives who both work. Kids go to school. They might be in a daycare or something like that. But they're still working ultimately together for what purpose? Raise their children. Raise their children get ahead. You know, make a life. Um, the idea is not to be... A burden on the rest of society right I mean that's kind of the goal is to get yourself to a place where you don't have to rely on the government and those types of things and if you have a husband and a wife together working it's kind of like the Bible says you know a, a two is better than than one and three is better than you know one you, they hold together they can hold fast strong when one falls down the other one can pick them up and so you have this thing that happens dynamically at every household 
which is if my wife goes down, guess what I can do? Jump in. If I go down, she can jump in. But what happens if you don't have that and you have kids? You know, it creates a difficulty. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And it still happens. And, and obviously, there's, there's those things that can take place and you can still be successful. But we're talking again, the, the perfect illustration. What's God's idea of how this should be if he could just have it just right? You know, how it ought to be. Husbands and wives work together to provide and take care of each other and so on. So that's, that's a good thing. The promotion of marriage is defined by God leads to a proper legal record and order. Ever think about that? We kind of don't think about this. Well, why do we need records of this? To some idea, it was so they would know who was married to who. So you could kind of keep that record officially. Well, what if I want to marry someone over here and it's not on the record? You know, there, there could be confusion of who's married in the gov- from a governmental standpoint, who is together, who's not, whose kids are these, what, who do they come from. So who's married to who? This allows for the protection of those unions. You're married to your spouse. The government can come in and say they're a married couple. We can protect this through whatever the laws are passed or whatever the rights are for a married couple. And there's no confusion. It's on the books. Let's protect this thing we're promoting. We should be promoting, which is marriage, right, between a man and a woman. Upholding God's definition gives order to society, eliminates chaos. That's about in everything. (laughs) But it does because you have order. Husbands? Wives, children, family, you know, it's all very clear. Roles are very defined. It just keeps things more orderly and it eliminates the chaos. So further reasons. The highest authority of a nation must define the most fundamental elements of society so it can survive and thrive. I mean, if you think about it, we just we kind of started with if you have a negative birth rate because you're, you're, you're discouraging traditional marriage between men and women having children. What happens ultimately to the country if that's discouraged? It starts to die out, starts to disappear because you don't have kids being born. And so this is a fundamental element to the survival of a country or to a nation because if you're not increasing your population, what happens to you? So you really shouldn't ever be negative on having children as a government. They might be neutral or promote it, but if you're negative on it, you end up killing yourself off, ultimately. If everybody ab- agreed with you and everybody followed that, you'd be gone. They must be for the good of all society, not just some. You know, what happens when the government starts catering to 1% or a half a percent of the population? Or just themselves. Or themselves, which would be like the 1%, right? <laughs> what ha- they, their, their job is to say what benefits the whole, even though it may offend some over here we're worried about the whole nation right promotion by the government doesn't always mean those who refrain are to be punished this is an important principle i want to hang out for a second on because some people will say the government shouldn't be involved in marriage because if they for some reason take a position on something that means they're going to punish the opposite of it and so people say i don't think the government should be involved that's not what i'm saying when i say the government promoting or defining marriage if a person says i choose not to get married should the government punish them for that no No. No. that's see that's not what we're talking about we're talking about what the government should promote you know i saw that my oldest was when he was little he would play the drums Mm -hmm. all time and i said you know maybe he's got a gift for that so guess what i started promoting the drums and maybe you should take some lessons and maybe you should try that. And so he gets into it and stuff, you know, and I don't know where it's going to go. But if he said, Dad, I don't want to play the drums. I'm not interested. Should I send him to his room, give him a spanking, punish him? <laughs> of course not, right? Because it's not an issue of, like, he's doing something evil here that I need to correct his evil behavior. It's I'm promoting what I believe is good. It's good for him. I think it'll be good. And if he says, I don't really want to do that, that's okay. I'm not going to punish him. I'm just also going to continue to promote good things. And so really, promotion has a lot here. And when I say what the government promotes is a big factor because it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to come in and punish you if you don't do what they promote. But you could miss out on something good if we don't have that clear definition from the highest authority. If the authority comes in and says, we know what's good, we want to promote what's good, That doesn't mean we're going to punish you if you say, I'm just not going to participate in that. Because we're not talking about evil. 
talking about good. Well, it sounds kind of like I'm splitting hairs to some degree. So we would say it's more of you're choosing to miss out on blessings versus you've done evil and you're going to be punished with judgment. And that's, that's an important distinction, especially on something like this, because there's some people that I'm not going to get married. In fact, Paul actually says, if you're single, stay single. And he's talking about it from the angle of, you know, if everybody listened to Paul, what would happen? I mean, you have to stop and ask the question. He's not making a national mandate here. He's saying that if you're in service, he wants people to be focused on service to the Lord. And so as a Christian, as you're struggling with, I want to serve, but I also want to get married. He says, you know, what should I do? He says, I, if I could encourage you, go out and do the work of the Lord first. So stay single so you can go do that. But he also says, you know what, there's times where people need to get married. So he's not giving us general mandate to all of humanity that no one ever should get married. That's not what Paul is saying. He's talking about your devotion to God. And I can tell you, having been a pastor who's married, you have a lot more things to manage. And I can remember doing youth when I was 18 and not married, and I lived at the church. I, can be, I remember being here at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., hanging out just with people from church. You know, we'd just come in and lock the door. We'd come in. This was like our, our place. You get married and have kids, you're not going to be at the church at 1 a.m., right? It just doesn't, not on purpose anyway, right? And so I think Paul's trying to just get that across. But it's a good thing is what he's saying. This is good, but I'm not going to punish you if you get married. You know, that's not, it's not a bad thing. And so you think about, you know, you get married, you have kids, they have the child tax credits. You know, it's like if you have kids, we're going to give you a tax break, you know. To me, those are promotions of, well, if you have kids, you're going to get this benefit. You know, but it doesn't mean that you need to necessarily have kids. It's just something the government is saying, here, you get a blessing if you do this thing. And I think it's just important to keep that in mind that people say, well, the government shouldn't say anything about it. They should just stay out of the definition of marriage. Well, the government's job is to promote what is good, you know, to put that out there and say, we want, we want people to do what's good. And some of those things are not necessarily, if you don't do it, we're going to punish you. We're going to throw you in jail for it. If it gets to that point, you've got a big problem, right? It's about, this is going to benefit society. We recognize that it may not be in every situation for every person to do, but it's going to benefit society, so we want people to do it. Hence, we also want you to get a job. We want you to, to work and contribute. Can some people not work? They can't. Should they be punished by the government? Should they be thrown in jail because they don't have that? There's just circumstances that are such that it doesn't always apply that way. The key here is the promotion. The government needs to promote what is good, and they need to know what the definitions of good are so they can promote it. That's different to a degree than their job to carry the sword and punish evildoers. Okay? Do you, do I, do I, I hope I made that somewhat clear that you know, we look at these things and say, just stay out of it, because if I don't get married now, if I, if I engage in something that doesn't meet this promotion, then I'm going to be punished. That's not what I'm saying. <coughs> The government's job is to point us and push us in the right direction of what's good you know, and have a, the definition that's appropriate for good. And if we say, no, nah, I don't think I want to work there or get married or have kids, I'm not going to be punished for that. Who gets to say what is and is not good? Some things were given some ambiguity. God says, you know what, I'm going to leave that up to you to decide, you know. Is it good for me to work at the church or is it good for me to work in the public? You know, mm -hmm. These are things that God says, okay, I don't have like a necessarily a rule on this one. But if he says, don't murder, don't commit adultery, you know, don't do these things, they're not good, they're evil, and we say, let's promote that. Now we've got a problem. And so it really comes down to who gets to decide what's good? Who gets to define that word? And if you have a government that says, well, we get to define it. You could have a lot of problems. Hence why the founders continually said, this government will work only for a moral and religious people. They said it repeatedly because they knew you had to ultimately say, if they do this and it's against the higher authorities, they're going to they're gonna push back. If you don't have the higher authority, it's free for all, isn't it? My opinion of good is no different than anybody else's in here. And so ultimately, it just comes down to who says. Who says? Who gets to say what's good? My grounding would be, it's not me. It's not even you. 
It's the person who created. It's the one who created that started this. It's his game. It's his system. It's his world. It's his universe. It's his human creation and human beings. He gets to decide that. And he's also not left us in the dark. He actually said, here's my words. Here's my instructions. You want to thrive? Follow these. You want to suffer? Go against them. As I think about our election, I think, you know, if we, if we pick the perfect leader, perfect president, okay? There, there is no such thing. But what if it was just, yeah, this is, this is just the best, absolute perfect. You know, that kind of defeats to some degree the rest of the story. Because where does Jesus come into this? I mean, does he, if we don't have any reason for him to come back because we're living in utopia, when he shows up, it's like, you know, we got it. Thanks, but no thanks. It sure sounds like, at least from what I read, that things are going to get worse because at some point people are going to be longing for the perfect leader. We're kind of there to some degree. Maybe not as far as God is, wants us to be. It's not bad enough yet. I don't know. But at some point, he's, when are we going to say, perfect leader, we need you, and then here he comes on a white horse. What happens if we get everything we ever wanted? Let's go in on a little bit. Here's a quote from Aristotle. You ever heard of Aristotle? Okay. He's not a, not a modern guy by any means. Not a Christian necessarily by any means. Here's what he said. Since the legislator should begin by considering how the frames of the children whom he is rearing may be as good as possible, his first care will be about marriage. At what age should his citizens marry and who are fit to marry? Aristotle saying the fundamental thing for the legislator to do is to define marriage. How does it work? How does it look? How are we going to promote it? Because it's fundamental to society functioning. This is Aristotle saying it. Right? So it's not just our founders who said this. A few more reasons. The husband-wife union is the best place for children. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, now you could make an argument and say, you know, there's some husbands and wives who are not good parents. That's a whole other discussion of, well, we should promote good behavior. How do you be a good parent? How do you treat your kids? But if everything was like it ought to be, and it was a good marriage, husband-wife, and they were, you know, dedicated to what was right and good, is the parent, is the kids being in their care the best place? Yeah, or should we put them in, in the state's care? No. Married couples do a better job at caring for children than institutions. That's true. That's true. Because why? I mean, what's the fundamental reason why? They love, they love them. It's my kids. Like, you know, I would, I would give anything, my own, including my own life, for my kids. Is the government going to do that for you? No. Probably not for your kids. They have a vested interest, and they have an emotional attachment. They have every a connection to this little one they've brought into the world to make they sure that they, they yeah. And the government should encourage that, right, that mentality amongst parents, right. instead of the idea that they're really not worth anything. They're really just, yeah, they're just kind of a pain. They're an annoyance. They mess up your careers, you know, fill in whatever negative blank. And so what happens is they start to allow and promote what? Eliminate the kids or don't have any. Hence why we have a negative birth rate. I mean, we're, we're, we're not growing, I should say, like we should be because we're not promoting this stuff. We're not promoting. We've changed the definition to some degree in people's minds of children in the sense of what's their benefit. What's the goodness that comes from them? How should they be brought into the world? And what conditions should they come forth? They've, they've eliminated that. It's kind of chaos in that realm now. It doesn't go well when you don't have somebody promoting the good and you know, pushing back against the bad as an authority figure. It doesn't work because people do whatever they want, right? All research points to the fact that children in a husband-wife marriage Commit less crimes. You can go look this stuff up. You can go look at research that's been done, studies that have been done. Husband, a good husband-wife marriage that they're in, they, it doesn't mean they're going to commit crimes. It just means the percentage is they're going to have less crimes if they're in a good home. Reach higher level of educational success. No. These, are just, these are just factual things that research shows. They have better health, mental and physical. Now, if you're the government, they're better off economically. If you're the government, are these good things that you want? You want less crime. You want people that are educated. You want people that are healthy because that's going to cost a lot of money. You want the economy to flourish. 
So if you say the fundamental thing that research shows that creates these things is a good married you know, parents who raise them up, then guess what we should promote as a government? That. Yep. It benefits us as a nation. See, this is kind of the Aristotle idea, you know. Hmm. Hold higher levels of morality. That's a big one, you know. That kind of ties into number one, commit less crimes and mm -hmm. down the list. They're more likely to have good and strong families of their own in the future. So guess what? This is a problem you can stop here, and then maybe it'll take care of itself going forward. So that it's in their best interest to stick to this traditional view of marriage. Marriage allows lifelong committed couples to care for each other rather than depend entirely on the state. Your spouse gets sick and you, they need help and they're by themselves. Someone's got to come in and help them. But if they're married and their spouse is healthy enough to help them, what happens? You can take care of each other. Now, again, just on a fundamental level, that's a good thing because now the government doesn't have to come in and participate. Right. It's, just, it's just one of these things that you have to stop and say it would be good for lifelong committed marriages because they can work together. They can take care of each other and we don't have to be involved. Married couples are more likely to be economically successful. Well, yeah, you got two people working towards a common goal together versus one. That's, that's just numbers. That's just math. Producing for society, caring for each other, of course. Intimate relationships between married couples, men and women, lead to healthy lives. It's more fulfilling when you have this type of relationship. It's good for your health. Homosexual couples or non-committed couples experience significantly more health risks and disease. That's true. It's just, it's just, just science has shown this. Yeah. People that go around, they just sleep around, they get sicker, you know. I don't know if that's right. Is that the right term, Linda? Sicker? Could you say that? Let proper grammar. They're more sickly. Is that? <laughs> so not only is immoral sexual behavior explicitly forbidden in Scripture, it causes significant damage to individuals in society. There's a reason God says don't do certain things. It's not because He's trying to be mean. It's because He says I don't want you to kill yourselves. I don't want you to hurt yourselves, and I don't want you to hurt other people. In fact, Jesus got the question: Which of the law is the most important? Of all the laws, you tell me which one's the greatest. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And he says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, you should be thinking about, does this honor God? Is this showing love to God? And then does this hurt other people? That's it. He says, sum it up. There you go. It covered everything. Adultery, murder, you name it. And so when God says this behavior is bad, there's two people he's thinking about. The individual who's doing it and the indi individuals who can be impacted by it, the other people outside of that one individual. Here's Romans 1. God gave them over, you know, gave them over to degrading passions for their females exchanged the natural relations for those contrary to nature. So he makes an argument from nature first. Remember, nature attests to, if everybody did this, goodbye human beings, right? And likewise, also males abandoned the natural relations with the female, were inflamed in their desire toward one another, males with males committing the shameless deed and receiving in themselves the penalty that was necessary for their error. So this seems to suggest from Paul that he had observed or had heard or understood that if you abandoned the natural and you went this direction, there was some negative consequence that the person who did it, the penalty, they received in themselves a penalty, Sounds like judgment is what it sounds like. Yes. But you could make the argument, yeah, it's judgment, but it's also just the reality of nature when you go against the natural. When you have this thing, it's kind of like we always take, okay, let's take a hammer. What's a hammer designed to do? Pound in nails. Let's use it to pry open something we shouldn't be prying open. What usually happens? I learned this when Dennis was the pastor here because he never <laughs> used a tool the proper way. <laughs> he would take... He would, t yeah, he would say, how can we make this work? And you'd yes. be lucky if you ended with no, you know, got all your fingers and toes and you didn't have an injury. But what happens when you use a tool, use something designed for this way, and you use it contrary to that? Usually what happens? You might get lucky and it might fix the, the problem. I've done that when you're working on stuff. But a lot of times you're taking a risk because what could happen? You can get hurt. And so when you don't do it, not only is there judgment, you can make the argument there's a judgment issue, 
But it also is just reality that if you don't use a hammer the way the hammer was designed, you're probably going to hurt yourself, right? And so I think sometimes Paul can say, yeah, God's in charge of this. He'll bring judgment. But sometimes it's just a matter of God saying, I'll just step back. I'll just let you do your thing and you use the tools however you want to use them and you see what happens. I've given you the instructions. You use them how you want. You tell me how it goes. We're over there trying to pry open a, you know, a refrigerator with a, you know, a pencil. Why is this not working? You know, it's ridiculous. It doesn't work. There's a lot of problems. I, I want to close with these stats, and then we're going to have a new topic next week. I think we've, we've spent a lot of good discussion and had a lot of good, good time to visit on this one. But just here's some stats. As of 2024, Gallup showed that 7.4% of Americans align themselves with the LGBTQ plus community. Now remember, government's job is for the good of everyone. Okay, that's their job. There may be some on the outside that they can't say we, we can't do that. We have to look at what's good for the whole. Only one in eight of those who are in the 7.4% identify as transgender. You see how this tiny, tiny thing has become the thing? Is 7.4% of a nation worth redefining a term that impacts the other 93? No. I would say no. Those who practice sexual immorality outside of the LGBTQ community are not trying to change the legal biblical definition. They just don't want to be restricted to a union. In other words, there's some people out there that just say, I don't agree with the biblical definition, but I don't care if it's, you know, the government defines it biblically. I just don't want to be a part of it. Does that make sense? Kind of the whole promotion versus punishment thing. But there's some that say, no, no, you're going to include me in that definition. Right? A couple other Stats, homosexual practices among males, 25 to 30 year life expectancy decrease. This is Romans 1. It's just in the stats. Infectious disease increase. Facts, just facts, not natural. Higher incident of suicide. A 1981 study found that only 2% of homosexual men were monogamous. 1978 study found that 43% of homosexual males have 500 partners or more. Which might lead to number one, two, and three on the list. <laughs> if the government allows or promotes this behavior, does it make society better or worse? worse. Is this good? So I've, we spent three weeks on this, and I, I want to make sure we just understand that marriage is important at, a, at all levels. And so when you see that language on your ballot, don't overlook its importance. It's extremely important, the definitions of these things, okay?